Today is Tuesday, the 28th of October, 2008. We are at the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. And uh, the interviewer is Wayne Clark. And today we are interviewing uh, Dr. Walter Gunther. Uh, Mr. G or Dr. Gunther, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth? I was born September 8, 1918 in Berlin. And I grew up in Berlin to the beginning of the war. Okay, and your, your full name is? Walter P. Paul Günther. Okay. And uh, you grew up in Berlin? Yes. Okay, and you at of course you attended school there. And what year did you graduate from high school? In 1937. And I started to study uh, law and philosophy at the University of Berlin when the war broke out and I was drafted immediately August 39. Okay. Basic training took place on the German-Polish border. And only the, up to winter and then we were sent to the wall and at Upper Rhine Valley, facing Strasbourg. Nothing happened there. Okay, now, um, how long was your basic training for? Oh, about uh, three, four months. Okay. Basic training was how to handle machine gun, mostly the gun, machine gun. Also, a little bit of artillery, you know, the, the 4.5, the very uh, light artillery. It was used against the panzers, so and hand grenade, and also a little basic service, basic help. And somebody got wounded. Was that your first time away from home? Pardon? Was that the first time you were away from home? Yes, it was the first time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And because you were in college when you were drafted, were you picked to go to officer school or? No, no. Okay. Just, just regular. But after the basic training, I was considered officer's candidate. Okay. That was a little ribbon about the opulence. But officer's school, that was for the professional officers. They went immediately to a place like Döberitz outside of Berlin. I was never there. Okay. So I really started from the very bottom. And. Okay. And. Uh... Where did you go next? Next, after basic training, to the wall uh, along the Upper Rhine Valley. Nothing happened there. We faced the French. The French called it the Drôle de Guerre, funny or strange war. Nothing happened. Not even one bullet uh, was exchanged. Okay, and this was in 1940? That was 1940 until spring till May 1940, when Hitler decided to attack France. Okay. We were then right away shipped from uh, the wall in direction to Trier, that's near the uh, border, Luxembourg and Sedan, but we were not involved in combat unit at first, in combat. Okay. The first um, combat we were involved was in uh, Chemin des Dames, the famous battlefield from the First World War. Our leadership was very poor. I had a lot of trouble. I was, by the way, promoted then to sergeant. Uh, I, had, I was very unhappy. My superior hated me and I hated him mm -hmm. very bad. He tried to keep me down forever. I was in his unit up to 1941, okay. so practically two years now, till I was wounded, and then I got in different. Okay, uh, how were you wounded? I was wounded in Russia the first time. Yeah, okay. That was a year later. In France, I was not wounded, although six people of our company were killed, about 15 were wounded. Mm -hmm. And that mostly in the so-called N was Canal, that was northeast of Paris, near the city of Reims or Reims in English many times, 
famous cathedral. So we bypassed uh, Paris, east of Paris, in direction to the Loire River, to the center or the heart of France. And uh, we were at first very much afraid of courageous counterattack. Mm -hmm. We were there and there was very little additional support of uh, artillery. We were just a line and again, something that never happened because everybody knew the history of France, the First World War, mm -hmm. how courageously they fought, that the Germans never made it in Verdun, they never broke through the lines, they never reached Paris, only the suburbs. So everybody knew that, and everybody knew how well the French army was equipped. Uh -huh. Well, they put all their energy in the New Maginot line, and there was hardly any reserve there. We didn't know that, mm -hmm. of course not. Okay. And it was uh, still on uh, Andoise Canal, for instance, the French were up a hill. It was a big meadow between the river and the canal, and we were exposed to direct fire, so it was very unpleasant and frightening to see Germans to the right and to the left being killed in the open field, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and hardly any artillery support on the German side, but the French had it. Mm -hmm. So okay. that was very... And then after this we crossed the Marne River during the night. Again, we were frightened and we knew that the French were uh, in the defense line on the other side of the river, but it didn't happen. They had fled partly uh, most of the soldiers were gone, and we took many prisoners, so they ran away. It was already chaos on the French side. Mm -hmm. Of course, we didn't know that, we didn't realize, yeah. we still were afraid somehow there will be a counter-attack. It can't be possible that we can break through that easily without severe and courageous resistance, but it happened. And still, then there was only sporadic fighting, and up to the Loire River, and after three, four weeks, there was armistice, and we were relieved, and I personally felt sorry for a French nation being defeated in such a fast way, and because my parents were very Francophile, my father had studied in Paris, he was a um, federal court judge. My mother spoke fluently French. We spoke fri twice a week French at home, uh -huh. just to get me a lift. And I am very grateful still, years, years later, that practically saved my life, because later I was prisoner of war in France, and I was about the only one who could speak French. Uh -huh. So that saved my life, was an interpreter. Okay. And then after that, you were sent to uh, Russia? At first to Romania. Romania? From France to Romania, and we could not understand what happened. Why to Romania? We knew they had a Nazi dictatorship. Uh, Antonescu was his name. They had got rid of their king, Karol. And, well, we said we just are there to help or to strengthen an unpleasant regime or unpopular regime till some June 40, uh, first, uh, 21st we attacked Russia mm -hmm. and we were afraid, we knew it and I personally studied a lot of history and I remember very well uh, part of French history when Napoleon decided to invade Russia. Talleyrand, his secretary, said, Sir, you are worse than a criminal. You are an idiot to attack Russia. And I remember that. Mm -hmm. And I knew 80 million Germans against 250 Russians. How could this, how could this ever end in a victory? Mm -hmm. uh, so the big surprise was we faced militia. Uh -huh. you know, 
means people at the age of 35, 40 year, years, very poorly equipped. Many times they had only two people, one gun, very poor soul, uh, shoes we saw, wooden soles. So it was pathetic. Mm -hmm. But the moment they tried to run away, there was a commissar who shot them. So that was the fight. We attacked along the Black Sea towards Odessa. Odessa was nearly an empty city. I don't know and I don't remember we were the first wave, but at least I remember there was hardly any uh, young men or young women. They were all gone, mm -hmm. only grandparents and grandchildren. So it was, uh, again, an eerie feeling to enter a city, no resistance. Mm -hmm. so it, and then uh, resistance started along the Black Sea towards Crimea. And that's where I was wounded the first time in fall 1941. Now, how were you wounded? Was shrapnel or were I you was shot? wounded and shot in the leg, in the, in the lower leg. So I okay. could not walk for a while, but right away, I, it was not a severe wound. It just through the, the calf of my leg. Okay, was, uh, were you, in direct combat at that point? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there was organized resistance on the northern end, northern side of the Crimea uh, insula. Okay. So, and the city of Sebastopol was not taken at first. It now was, at that, that point, were you well equipped and well supplied? Yeah. That. Okay. Now once you were shot... And then I was taken back to a hospital in Germany. Okay. Unfortunately, I got out of that unit. <laughs> I was still a sergeant, and they even gave me a nickname, the permanent sergeant, because I was never promoted. I was supposed to be a lieutenant already. Uh -huh. But the uh, commander, again, disliked me very much, and I disliked him as much as he did. So. OK. And how long were you in the hospital for? Uh, during the winter, Okay. 41. OK. And did, then, did you get to visit your family? Yes. At all? Yeah, I was able. I was at first was that taken back to Bucharest, the capital of Romania, and hospital, and it was quite a nice experience because the wife of the dictator came and visited the visited the wounded German soldiers, okay. and she uh, spoke in in Romanian language, of course. And then she suddenly said one word in French, and I could uh, thank her in French. Uh -huh. You know, je vous remercie beaucoup, Madame. It's a grand honor. You know, I thank you very much. It's a great honor to meet you. And she was very much surprised, and so it was quite a pleasant experience. She handed out little packages of cigarettes and cookies, and uh -huh. so. Okay. And then back to Germany. Okay. A different unit. Then it was 1942. Okay, L let me ask you, yeah. uh, when you went to visit your family, yeah. uh, had, had they uh, felt any of the effects of the war? Your Not father? yet, too okay. much. It was strict, um, strictly rationing, but still it was not alarming, you know. Now, was your father still a judge at that point? Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. He was just a judge, and then he retired during the war. Okay. So we lived in the western part of Berlin, and that all came later. It was all destroyed and bombed out and so on. Okay. All that right. was the winter 41-42. Okay. It was a catastrophe, of course, on the northern front towards Moscow and St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were sent back to uh, Russia. Yeah. And but in a different unit. Yeah. That was in 42. What, and that, okay, what what unit was that? That was the Sixth Army. Okay, was built up in towards Stalingrad, 1942. It was quite hastily built up. I still remember we did not even have artillery. Okay, so just 
put together the units. You didn't know yourself, your fellow soldiers or fellow sergeants. So back to Russia mm -hmm. and uh, up to the Donets and Don River towards the Kalmyk Steppe that was towards Stalingrad. And that's where I was wounded the second time, west of Stalingrad. Okay, there was a lot of resistance at Stalingrad. And, yes, but I was <coughs> wounded before the real resistance started. I was okay. wounded west of Stalingrad. So. Okay, how but are you? still already many people were killed. Okay. Yeah. And how were you wounded this time? I was wounded with shrapnel. With shrapnel? Uh, ribs. Shrapnel. Okay. And was again not very serious wounded, but I lost a lot of blood. And again, I was taken back to the hospital in Germany. Okay. While our unit got caught in Stalingrad. And of course, you know the disaster of Stalingrad. Mm -hmm. uh, Paulus, very unpleasant man. We called him a salon officer. Salon, you know, a man who clicks all the time, smiles all the time, always say yes to his superior, and who had accepted stolen Jewish property in Berlin. Everybody knew that. Mm -hmm. Well, if you do this, you know, you are Hitler's poodle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Hitler for, uh, forbid him to break out of Stalingrad. Mm -hmm. And the German forces were 20 miles west of Stalingrad. They could have easily saved the 100,000 of German soldiers. No, he was forbidden. Hitler promoted him to field marshal. At the same time, forbade him to break out. But he finally surrendered in January 41. The big fat Goering prom promised, of course, supply from the air. It never happened. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. And I, again, I survived because I was luckily wounded before the, Rus the Russians broke through the German supply line. Now, you, so, you mentioned you were helped by, by your fellow soldiers? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. All the time. It was really... I survived thanks to camaraderie. Mm -hmm. That was got accepted automatically. I remember even uh, a year later in Russia, a delegation when I was already a company commander, a delegation of soldiers came proper and told me, we want you to know we don't let you bleed to death in the battle. We pull you out. I was very moved mm -hmm. by that. It, the only thing I could say, I would do the same thing. For in the battlefield, there is no difference. Mm -hmm. no. Okay, now after the second time you were wounded, yeah. you went back to Germany again? Back again to Germany. Okay. And that and was now a year later. Okay. And a rebuilding of the Sixth Army. The Sixth Army was destroyed. 91,000 soldiers surrendered. And about eight years later, 6,000 came back. Mm -hmm. Five people out of my company came back after the rebuilding of the six. I was one of the six people. Maybe a few uh, more survived, more, no, more severely wounded ones. So, and that rebuilding took place in France. Okay. Now, do you want to tell us about how you were promoted to a, to an officer finally? Yeah. How did that come about? In France, 1943. You know? Okay. Of course, 42, I was a new unit. They didn't know me. I didn't know them. I was still a sergeant. Now, 43, a rebuilding of the German army. And then I was uh, wounded to, uh, was commissioned within six weeks. Okay. In France, you know. Okay, D did you have to go for any training or? Yes, there was a training, but I had already so much better experience. You know, mm -hmm. It was no problem for me. Yes, there was three weeks training you know, as a commander, but it was no problem for me. Okay. So, All right. I was very lucky I found 
wonderful superiors. Okay. Yeah. It's Are funny, it, it really clicked. They liked me, I liked them. Mm -hmm. So in the first minute said we are in the right unit. Yeah. So that was in France and the general feeling in Germany after the disaster of Stalingrad was it's the beginning of the end. Uh -huh. We lost the war. No. It, it sent shock waves to Germany. Mm -hmm. And Germany ran out of manpower. Mm -hmm. 1943 in spring in Bretagne, that's where the rebuilding took place, people, the young soldiers age was between 15 and 17 years old. Undernourished, frightened, because everybody knew what happened in Russia, in yeah. Stalingrad, and everybody knew we are going to be back to Russia. Uh -huh. facing death. Okay. Now, during this time, were you able to communicate with your family? Yes. Through all the time. Time. All the time, yeah. Okay. And in France, uh, we felt it was always a paradise, a fl flourishing uh, black market, mm -hmm. but of course, very expensive. Mm -hmm. Your food, you could get food, but uh, let's say for a week's pay, you could maybe get one meal at a black market. However, the French were very anxious in exchanging rings, wristwatches, uh -huh. okay? Because I spoke French, so I managed to um, get more acquainted with the owner of the restaurant, and very easy. They didn't want too much money, but they said, well, maybe I could get you silver. So I sent uh, I uh, asked my mother to send home, why, why don't you send home, you have so much silver at home. And she sent plenty of silver, and for each item I get two meals. Oh. For each spoon, two meals, each fork, so uh -huh. she had about sent, I don't know how much. It was wonderful, and I, she gave me kind of uh, uh, coupons, and I can give it to the good sergeants, I had two very good sergeants, so I gave them and I gave it to another sergeant, so I was in the meantime an officer now. Uh -huh. right. And of course, in the fall, back to Russia, 1943. Now how did you get to Russia, by train? By train, and then partly um, on tracks to the line between Kiev and Sharkov. Mm -hmm. And a big surprise, it was very quiet spot. Nothing happened. Now, what about the winters there? Were they pretty brutal? The winter, it was, yeah. But then the German army was ready and they had an additional cover, you know, uh, nylon uh, material. And you could sleep on the snow and you still kept warm. It was okay. outside white and inside khaki, so in springtime you could turned inside out, and that was very good. In contrast to the first winter, which was a catastrophe, mm -hmm. there was no equipment ready. They had only a coat and blanket. That was not enough. Uh -huh. Yeah, And that was, for a certain time, relatively quiet. Okay? I still remember it was kind of a big, valley, large valley. We were here on the little hill, and they were there on the little hill, about half a mile away no man's land, but you had to be very careful because sometimes during night the Russians came and planted mines and the Russian mine was very, very effective and very dangerous uh -huh. because you stepped on it and you lost at least a leg. And many times there was no immediate help, you bled to death. Uh -huh. you know? And it was just a little kind of cigar box very primitive in contrast to the German mines, like a big mushroom, you know, uh -huh. was mostly protected, protection against the Russian tanks. Uh, very feared T-34, was, was very good on the Russian side. Ours was not as well as the Russian tank, but Germany re uh, rebuilt tanks and did now the other extreme two heavy tanks, which got stuck many times. Okay. So All right. And 
And then you were wounded a again? Yes, but that was a half a year later. Okay. We were there, be, uh, kind, kind of a standstill between Charkov and Kiev, but hell broke loose at Christmas night. So we noticed already all movements there, walking back and forth, and the Russians attacked the night at Christmas, and on my, I hardly saw them. They came from the right corner and attacked the right wing of my company, and we defended ourselves as long as we could, and we finally ran out of ammunition. There was one wave of Russian, the second wave, we thought we defeated them. No, there was a third wave, a fourth wave. Manpower was no problem in Russia. Uh -huh. But here we were thinner and thinner, thinned out our defense line. So they broke through our line. We ran out of our ammunition. We didn't want to be taken prisoner of war. In the meantime, uh, the Russian uh, warfare became very brutal. Uh, I knew very well they shot each uh, officer each German officer, the first thing they did. No, I didn't want to be shot, that's easy to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had my own handgun and I thought, the last bullet before they shoot me, I shoot myself. It's easy to say, uh -huh. but probably hard to do. Now what kind of weapon did you carry? I carry, at first, a machine pistol. It was not very good in uh -huh. Russia. Then the regular rifle was very good. Uh, my, let's say, what was very good? The machine, German machine gun was very good. It was air-cooled, model 34, and it was very good. It was also not wasteful in regard to ammunition. You could pull each uh, individual shot or you uh -huh. know, five, six balls. So it was very good and very effective. Much better than the Russian. The Russian, I would say, generally speaking, half of them were Duns. So the Russian artillery, very, not very good, but still, they had plenty of ammunition. Uh -huh. The Russian machine gun was as half as good as the German. You heard it much slower, dut, 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 dut. the Germans was so when the Russian then broke through our lines, and many times we were surrounded, we knew and heard exactly, ah, here are the Russians to the right and to the left. Again, we are encircled. Are we going to make it? Mm -hmm. So I divided my company. I had two very good sergeants. I said, it's easier to sneak through the lines in a small group than the big ones. And we had, again, the very good additional um, winter uh, camouflage uniform, so they didn't see it. Once when so there were frightening moments, you know, we were western direction, and the Russian tanks also came out. So we said, "Play that." No, they didn't see us. They bypassed half a mile away. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. So, and there were some. Very frightening moments. We knew we were surrounded. You heard it, you know, all around. And uh, it started uh, very serious uh, problems of discipline. Some of my students practically, some of my soldiers collapsed practically. So we are lost, you know, we'll die, all of us. You know, it's hopeless, you know. Mm -hmm. so, and I knew it was a very dangerous moment, I thought. And I said, no, we will not be lost, I guarantee you. I know in 20 miles away, it's a safe heaven, you know, mm -hmm. a city where we reach the German defense line. And we have to know, and we will make it. And you know, a German saying is, De determination can move mountains and we will make it. Mm -hmm. And now again, he started to cry, and so, have a good cry, okay? It's, no, it's not a shame, he cried, so he came to me and cried, so all right, I give him a bear hug, good. 
And I realized, oh, that's a very critical moment in my unit. Mm -hmm. It may fall apart, people may run away and try to break through on their own, that's hopeless. And fortunately, uh, the danger was over and we made it to the first safe heaven and then another safe heaven and so on. So you were on foot at, at this time? Yeah. You walked all the Towards way? Towards western direction. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And some very critical moments. First, so got safe heaven. We reached, I reached, there was a, a captain there, said, okay, good, but I have order, I have to blow up all the supply in three hours. I said, I said God, I said, I said, you are not going to blow this up. From now on, I take over. Okay, oh, you can do it, I'm a captain. Okay, yes, I can, things are different. You are not going to destroy food. We need food and we have to take food as much with us as possible because we don't know, you know, wherever and whenever we can get more supply. Mm -hmm. So, and he got quite nasty. <laughs> Very simple what I did. I put my gun and shut through the ceiling. And so, you understand now. <laughs> I had in a certain way a little fun uh -huh. <laughs> with him. Yeah, he was the first one to leave. Hmm? He, had, he had his jeep there, you know, waiting to... I told him, I give you an order to take three of my soldiers with me. I cannot. Yes, you can. They can sit on top of us. Oh, sit outside. They were children. One of them always started to cry. It was pathetic. Hmm? Okay. Well, and from one safe heaven to the other, and with a lot of luck, we made it. And I was then, through the winter, in March uh, 44, we reached the Polish-Russian border. Russia was almost lost. There was, of course, the summer of the Battle of Kursk, the second big disaster. From now on, uh, the Russians took the initiative. Mm -hmm. The Germans could not. We ran out of manpower. Impossible. The Germans got weaker and weaker, and the Russians got more, uh, stronger and stronger. We saw it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was wounded there. That was very serious wound here in the face. That okay. was. Well, were you hit with shrapnel there? Or? No, with a so-called dum dum. You know that means a bullet. The Russians were cut the top of a bullet. Yeah. And it tears there for bigger bullets. Uh -huh. So I just crossed around. I was wounded here and out here. Okay. It was very bad. Okay. And it was so bad, it was beyond pain. And I've seen people dying. Mm -hmm. I knew if you don't have any pain anymore, that means death is approaching. Mm -hmm. And I saw it in the face of the just two wonderful sergeants who helped me to get out of my hole. They started almost to cry and they said, oh, for heaven's sake, stop crying. It makes it only more difficult for me. Mm -hmm. And then I, I went to my battalion commander and major and I saw written in his face, you know, he's going to die. That, you know, I saw it. And very lucky, I knew my colonel. And he came from Berlin. <laughs> two blocks away where I lived from. Uh -huh. And he managed to get a helicopter seat for me, a seat in the helicopter, and I was taken Now, th that must have been very unusual to have very a helicopter. Unusual. Very unusual, yeah. Okay. They were very primitive, the first helicopter. There okay. were only four little seats and the pilot and his assistant for six persons. Okay. And he managed this, thanks to him, and he practically saved my life. I okay. was flown to the university clinic of Lemberg or Schwoff, that's Galicia, the capital, in southern Poland, which is today Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from there, I was taken to Dresden Hospital, only to witness the horrible uh, destruction of Dresden. I spent almost a year in hospital. 
I could not eat for about several months. The jaw was dislocated. <coughs> we had to pull it back, bone transplant, and so on. They did a marvelous job in the special clinic. So today you hardly need it, mm -hmm. need it but it still bothers me. Mm -hmm. you know, I had a very severe concussion, of course, and that I feel once in a while. I, I, but I know. Okay. Now, were, were you in the hospital when the war ended? Yes, almost. <laughs> you know, the, <clears throat> the destruction, the horrible uh, uh, bombing of Dresden. Mm -hmm. I was there in the suburbs, and everybody who could walk, I could walk then already. I had to learn how to walk, because I don't hear, you know, mm -hmm. the balance of uh, equilibrium is in the ear. Yeah. And I saw this exactly, but I ran against the wall. That's, it took a while, the body uh, to readjust. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and then, almost the irony was, then I uh, went sent to a unit in the western part of Germany, in the Teutonic Forest, that is close to Dutch border. Now it was already March and April 45. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And take over a company here, yeah, defend Western Germany here in the Teutonic Forest, okay, with the English and the American forces and so on. And it was almost a, a grotesque situation. We had maybe 10 French rifles, 10 Belgian, 5 Dutch, hardly any ammunition. Mm -hmm. And we were up on a hill and could see the highway, and I gave an order uh, not to shoot. said, if you shoot, they come already. We saw them coming. But if you shoot, that's the end of you, okay? You will surround it, and okay? You want to survive, you know? You know it's the end of the war. So I gave orders not to shoot. Everybody was delighted to follow that. So, and they came the English forces and probably American forces, so we could see them coming, and so, okay, we are again surrounded, but the war is over, go home. In 10 minutes, people were gone. <laughs> oh, really? In the forest. Okay. And I only warned them, please be very, very careful. Many times in no man's land, uh, SS unit, mm -hmm. and if they catch you, they shoot you right away as mm -hmm. deserter because they knew also their end is coming. So, and that was the end. Now, my problem was, where do I go? The war is over. Certainly not back to Berlin, where the Russians are. The Russians took everybody uh, with a gun and sent <laughs> the war. Another war. All right. Let me. Now, did you surrender to the Americans, or no? You just. It was just the end of the war, and everybody went home, if possible. But I was in West Germany. I did not have any friend in West Germany. Okay. Although a fellow officer said, "Come with me to the Rhine River. I have an apartment." My parents, my in-laws, something must have survived. But on the way, we were arrested. No. Okay. Now I don't know what an English, American, I could not see the difference. Okay. Now, were your, do you know if your parents were alive at this point? or I knew that both were killed. In the bombing of Berlin? Yeah. My mother was killed in, in March 44, about the time I was wounded. I had no connection, of course, during the retreat in Russia, yeah. okay? We had a beautiful summer home outside of Berlin. My father was killed in February 45, a, through a bomb, you know, direct hit, so. Okay. So I knew there was no way going back to Berlin. I would not have gone anyway because the Russian had conquered Berlin mm -hmm. and they took every able-bodied men to Siberia, to the coal mines. That means four weeks to live. Yeah. So, 
I stayed in with this friend of mine. We were both arrested, then we were separated, and about half a million of German prisoners of war were taken to France. It was hell at first. So you were but taken to, read to France? about concentration camp. Okay. Right? We were at first on a meadow, no, nothing to eat but a little bit of bread a day. Uh -huh. After a week, the first people died, usually the very young and the older ones. The one of my age could survive better, they were hard enough. Then, from there, in a big factory hall in Rennes, France, nothing ready for us, just plain cement floor, no uh, blanket, no beds, okay? And about 20, 30 people died daily. Okay? Of course, I don't blame the friends. They even had themselves not enough to eat. Mm -hmm. So, and the Germans, so. Now, what saved my life was my knowledge of French. In no time, they wanted a, an interpreter. Hardly anybody spoke French. I did. Okay, had no problem. And instead of getting one little bit of watery soup a day, I went down to 110 pounds. Okay, everybody went so. And then it went better and better. And the irony is, uh, the soldiers where uh, could volunteer and go out and work on the farms. So that means they survived, and mm -hmm. means they have enough to eat. But the officers were not allowed to do this. According to an old agreement from 1895, or I don't know what. Mm -hmm. However, there were always a little way uh, to, uh, to rearrange things, and if you had a like, let's say a group of 10, 20 people, you could take over and apply in the community and you were like a foreman there. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did and that's how I survived there. That was in Britain. And okay. the funny thing is, my wife is French and she comes from Britain. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not far away where I was prisoner of war. We never met, we met here in the United States. Uh -huh. <laughs> Now, were you still in uniform at that point? Yes, yeah. Okay. And then we got some odd pieces of American uniform, of English uniform, because, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then at what point did they release you? Huh? What point did, were you released? Uh, a, a 1947, almost two years later. Oh, really? Back to Berlin. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very bitter homecoming, okay? because uh, the moment I was, um, let's say, received my freedom, I didn't know where to go to. Uh -huh. I had no home, I had no job, I was still not very good shape physically, okay? I knew my parents were killed. Uh -huh. Now what I about this, a, the summer home you had? Yeah, what? that was outside. The Russian zone. The Russian zone, okay. Yeah. I would not go there. It was all destroyed. There was a village. Okay. So, and I had an aunt in Berlin and I could stay in a little, uh, uh, that's a maid's room. But of course, they had two or even three other family in one apartment because so much was destroyed. People were forced to accept them. Uh -huh. So. And after a while, I said, what can I do here? Okay. I wanted to continue studies, university. The university was controlled by communists, East Germany, East Berlin. Mm -hmm. The historical section of Berlin was in the East. So I applied, oh, long, long questionnaire. What was your parent? Were your parents communists? Where, why were they not communists? I could not, I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. I went to the man and said, ha, 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 you don't seem to know that we are now the farmers and the workers' republic. So, mm -hmm. application. 
So there I was, what should I do now? I'm not going to live in, in East Berlin, okay, West Berlin. I could find finally a room up in the attic, have to store it home. But positions were open for teachers because many teachers were Nazis. Uh -huh. so, and I found in no time a position to teach French and history. So, and again, uh, I never forget, it was horrible, the, the food rationing. It was famine, practically, after the war. It, if you didn't have anything to trade in to the American soldiers or English, you died. Okay. And I traded in all my decorations <laughs> in the Berlin Zoo, flourishing black market. Mm -hmm. okay. For for candy bar, so I don't know what, for cigarettes mostly, because if you had cigarettes, you can go to a baker and three cigarettes, one hard roll. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Money was worthless. Hitler had printed so much. No, no. And then uh, I finally, my brother found me. My brother had emigrated in 1935 to the United States he didn't want to serve in the Nazi army. So, but it took two years to find me. Now everything was destroyed. Hmm. There was no postal service. And then I immigrated. He, was, he lived here in Albany. He had a good position. He was a lawyer already. He worked for the Court of Appeals. He could help me. So, and that's how I arrived here. And, I'm very happy and grateful to be an American citizen. So many don't know what it means to be in freedom, to live in freedom. To, and <clears throat> okay, and, and what year was that you arrived in America? 1951. 51. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I had to wait a little while. There was a long waiting line, mm -hmm. and war brides came at first, and so. Uh -huh. Okay. But then I ran in Albany and I, uh, because I, I didn't have really a diploma, okay, I had kind of, they gave me um, quite a good, let's say, credit for a PhD, and not PhD, for a um, bachelor's. Yeah. And I only had to take some course in education, American education, and so on. And then I got my master in Middlebury, and I got PhD in University of Albany. And what and did you get your PhD in? When? In French and German culture and history. Okay. And in the meantime, I also went back to France and got a diploma from Sorbonne. Okay. So I had many diplomas and I taught at the Albany school system and I was very happy. I taught special classes. People, they get college credit for it. So okay. It's a big school system, and among 3,000 students, there are always 50 or 100 who are really anxious to learn. Okay. Now, French and German. Okay, now was this in college you taught? Yeah. It, that was college level. They got credit in college for it. Okay. Although I taught in high school. Oh, okay. That was level five. I see. They had at least five years of foreign language. They could speak really, some of them fluently German. I refused to speak any, any English. Say, that I verstehe kein English. <laughs> I don't understand any English. And the French I said, I comprends pas anglais. <laughs> so I said, I don't English. So anything we did was in French or in German. And they learned a lot and they loved it. Okay. okay? Even yeah. the, go to the toilet, was it in French? Oh, I don't know. Right? You are going to learn. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you met your wife in the States? Yeah. Here in, in the early 60s, there was a, a, a very interesting club, a so-called International Center. Many uh, immigrants met there. I was in charge of the German section, and I was very active in the French section, contributing to the program. Mm -hmm. So and that's how I met my wife. Okay. My wife was a widow of an American soldier and had a son. So I have a stepson and I have a son. Yeah. But I don't like the word stepson. Uh -huh. So we are very, we are very close. Okay. So, 
All right, and um, and then in retirement, uh, and even before retirement, I was the president of the Teachers Association, of German and French, and we had programs all over in the states. You know? uh -huh. And one, we had a program in West Point, and I met a colonel there and became very good friends. He retired in the meantime, and then for about 10 years, there was nothing, okay? And we had two years ago a very interesting uh, meeting and conference on the Second World War in Gilderland, that's outside of Albany. Yeah. And there were two, uh, two officers from West Point participating, and I participated, and they approached me, and they said, could you and are you willing to come to us and talk to the cadets and said yes very much so and new ties and new friends and very good friends the colonel here he called me by his first name i call him and he's wonderful he knows an awful lot and he is for me a young hero uh -huh. because he has been already two years in iraq oh i see yeah, yeah. So, oh. highly decorated. So, he was just a lieutenant colonel, and then this year, this summer, he was promoted to the colonel, and he, I was invited at the ceremony, and it was very moving for mm -hmm. me. Uh, and I will be back there. I wait any minute uh, for, to hear from him. Okay. I was twice this year giving talks to the cadets mostly about Russia uh -huh. and the, the problems of discipline and uh, leadership, how I managed to keep my, let's say, sheep together. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, um, over, over the years since you got out of the military, did you ever encounter anybody that you had served with af after the war? Or? Only once in Berlin, uh -huh. one of my company, yeah. Quite an interesting story. Uh, I have to return back. After Stalingrad, they say Hitler turned uh, against his own people, introducing the Russian type commissar system. Mm -hmm. Because a political officer with unlimited power, you know, who should weed out the so called pacifists or the Democrats and could degrade you any minute, you could lose your rank. Very dangerous man. Mm -hmm. to face. So, with propaganda talk, fortunately, on the battlefront, you don't see him too much, but in the back, mm -hmm. more or less. So, and uh, now, the man I met in Berlin from my company uh, uh, had told a joke about Hitler. Maybe I tell the joke. Uh -huh. yeah. It's a very good one. Many times it's a play of word and it Losers. So Hitler is a uh, Hitler's driver drives too fast and kills a dog. Hitler said, You have to go to the farmer and tell them you killed that son of a bitch. So the driver went to the farmer and it took minutes and minutes he came back very happy. And Hitler said, Oh, they were wonderful people. They were so nice to me. What did you say? Yes, I said. I'm Hitler's driver, I killed that son of a bitch. <laughs> and everybody hugged and kissed me. <laughs> he got half a year, you know. Uh, somebody turned him in after having told a joke. He got half a year in a so called punished unit. That means pick up mines in no man's land. Wow. That means you are ready to die. Yeah. Yeah. So he survived. And he in Berlin, somehow, somebody screamed, you know, over Leutnant Günther, <laughs> said, nobody knows me here, no, who is, well, this can't be true. Maybe somebody else was the name. No, he came running, uh -huh. a big bear hug. <laughs> and so, that's about the only one I met, yeah, one person, yeah. Okay. All right, and, uh... You were a young man while Hitler was rising to power. Yes. Do you remember what it was like? Was there a lot of fear in 
in the uh, community about this? It started, yeah, step yeah. by step. Mm -hmm. At first, uh, it, I hate to say it, but he was very popular. Mm -hmm. He said, not one penny to France anymore, Treaty of Versailles, you know Germany was sure. severely punished to pay. Okay? I, the democratic government of Weimar tried to get uh, relief, let us, allow us to pay less, you know, the situation is so bad. Hitler said, not one penny. Well, he was very popular. Mm -hmm. There were millions of people without a job. Overnight, they found a job, well, very easy, building up the army. Sure. From 100,000 men to 5 million people. So everybody suddenly was, had a job and was very happy. Okay? Okay, well, of course, they kicked the Jews in the derriers. Okay, when he said, Well, it's rotten, you shouldn't do that, you know. But I'm happy I have a job, you know. I was five years out of a job. No? So it's very difficult to judge and uh, my family or our family doesn't didn't suffer at all. They were mm -hmm. very well to do. I would say almost rich, so no. Mm -hmm. They traveled all over. My friends and my father had traveled all over the world as a young man. <coughs> so that was but the moment the war started, Hitler lost his popularity. Everybody said, oh, only 20 years ago, 1918, you know, my grandmother said, we have not forgotten the horrible years of the First World War, the hunger, the starvation, the civil war after the war, mm -hmm. when the communists tried to take over in Berlin, particularly with the help of Soviet Russian commissars. So, and then, yeah, but, and the worse the situation, the more radical and the more brutal the regime became. Huh? Mm -hmm. We know exactly in uh, 1943, there was a new term created, it was Sippenhaft in Germany. It's an old Teutonic word. Sippen means a larger family and Haft means arrested. So if something happened, you told a joke, you made a remark, you know, you were arrested and put in a concentration camp. And if they could not get you, they put your next relatives in. So if I would have said something like, oh, you see, no, we are going to lose, no? Mm -hmm. Somebody would turn in, my parents would have put, would have been put in the concentration camp. That means you don't less, mm -hmm. sure. you would have. A, a month and you die there. No? You are supposed to die there. Mm -hmm. So everybody knew that. No. Nobody knew really can say about Auschwitz and Treblinka. Mm -hmm. They were of course rumors all the time and they knew the, the Jews are somehow picked up. That was even my first horrible experience on our own house, uh, the apartment house in Berlin. There were two Jewish sisters. 1941, they were, my parents told me, you know what happened? The Jews are being picked up during the night, not police, not army, no special units, you know, not uniforms. And they take them somewhere to the east, you know, like cattle. Mm -hmm. huh? And I knew that, I saw it, you know? and then you come back and fight for this regime, you know? that brutal criminal regime, mm -hmm. you know? and may give your life for it. I knew very well what happened, you know? and millions knew, and they were trapped. You know? so, okay. And also, also, Auschwitz, after the war, yes. All these rumors in Berlin about it. And of course, that was a Poland. You know, mm -hmm. Hitler was a very shrewd fellow, brutal and shrewd. So nobody could travel more than 50 miles, you know, unless you apply, you know, to go to Dresden or so, let's say, for a certain reason. 
-hmm. But it was mostly denied, unless you visit a site or relative in the hospital. That was an exception. So nobody could travel to Poland. And that's mm -hmm. where really the organized murder took place. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much for yeah. your interview. Okay, we have your decorations, or a few of your decorations. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to explain to them, to us what they are? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. This one is the infantry badge, and that's the highest decoration. It was only awarded to people from combat units. You know? Okay. Then the second uh, Iron Cross first class, I had Iron Cross second class already in France, but you only wore, used to wear a ribbon. Okay. This is a first lieutenant, and that is silver for three times being wounded three times in Russia. Okay. And then what is this other badge? The other in? is just the infantry uh, badge. That okay. was not a very high decoration, but you get it after, let's say, half a year in Russia. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much. Good.